Hi, I'm Rob Vanstone, and welcome to the 59th edition of the Rider Rumblings video podcast. Each week, we pick a rider uniform number uh, from today or from yesteryear that corresponds to the number of the podcast. So, number 59 for Murray and his Pittsburgh Steelers, we will pick Jack Ham, the great linebacker. Yes, that's a good number. Uh, the nickname was, I think, Dobre Shunka. Uh, I think it was Pol- a Polish nickname for Jack Ham, I think. Really? Dobre Shunka, they called him. Just got me there. Yeah. And um, uh, for, from a rough fire context, the great Ralph Galloway. I forgot to enumerate some 50, number 58s last week, so here's to Bill Burrell and Ken Reed. And I also forgot to do number 56, Ray Cernick. Number 56 was killed in the 1956 Mount Slessy uh, air crash. So to Ray Cernick, number 56. Our special guest today is uh, special in every sense of the word, just an absolutely terrific gentleman, uh, Craig Smith. Uh, he was the Rough Riders Director of Player Personnel in 2013 when they won the Grey Cup and uh, also worked in a personnel capacity with Hamilton. We got to know Ron Lancaster very well, BC, and most recently the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Born in Winnipeg, grew up a CFL nerd like I did, yeah. except he did so with credibility. Uh, flank, uh, to, Mer- to Craig's left is, is the... Uh, Estimable, 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 estimable. I'm not going to use that word again. Murray McCormick. Thank you for joining us, Murray, even though it's part of your obligation. I hope Craig lives up to that introduction because the pressure is on for He's you now, buddy. As well, gonna... well, I'm I'm surrounded by some legends here, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be tough. Uh, yeah. Mark Melnichuk is indeed a legend, our producer. So, <laughs> thank a legend you. in my own mind. Yeah. So it's a good spot to be. Few things to talk about. Uh, um, the Simone Lawrence suspension upheld by the. Arbitrator after a 348-day uh, uh, <laughs> deliberation. Uh, riders are playing the BC Lions this week, so that's obviously topical. Montreal Alouettes, good news, bad news. They've won two in a row, and there's a, there's a <laughs> they've fired Cavis Reed, and it's a bit of a gong show off the field. So and it's never entirely perfect in Montreal. Why don't we start with the Simone Lawrence, uh, that being upheld, the two-game suspension that he was initially issued eons ago in fact stands uh craig your thoughts on well, that it's about time yeah i mean it's just it was obvious and they keep on showing the hit again and again and you just wonder why it took so long but you know it's about time the, the ironic thing is is he's going to miss a game against the riders and you know in a way it's a good thing because it i think it rewards the riders in some way because they don't have to face him it also avoids a bit of a circus, mm-hmm. but from a marketing standpoint, mm-hmm. I mean, and I, I know the teams in the league don't look at it like this, but w- would that not have been a ticket selling engine for that August 1st game against Hamilton? Simone Lawrence coming in and return from suspension or what have you, is, is this going to cost the riders at the gate a bit? I don't think those things sell tickets anymore. I hate to say it. I think the rivalry... The ugliness. I think it, the fans there would have been on his case a lot. I don't know if some more fans are just going to uh, jump on the bandwagon to boo Simone Lawrence. I, I, that's my thought, but I agree with Craig. I can't believe it took this long. It took him two seconds to, to, took him, what, two seconds to make the hit. He gets penalized and everything, and now we're still in, in July, and he's still finally suspended. Which, and I go back, and my thoughts about this, I don't know if Craig thinks this way, I still think he should have been injected from the game, mm-hmm. a one-game suspension, and then it's done. Well, you take a, you take a look at NCAA. If that happens, you know, they'll look at it that for targeting. If the targeting is, you know, it's deemed targeting, the kid is gone, and then he's gone for the next game. Yep. And that's it's so easy because you know you see a, a, a hit to the head, it's targeting. But so. We- We'd still be in Hamilton if we're waiting for the arbitrator's yeah. decision on that one right yeah. now. I mean, it was so appeals long. and everything else. That's and with respect to the, you know, the, you know, the tickets, I'm just hoping that Hamilton coming in, who's a good team, is going to sell tickets. It's a good team. It's going to be a good matchup. Uh, Saskatchewan played them tough in the first game. Now they're coming here. Should be, hopefully, sell tickets in that respect. It's uh, At least they made the right decision ultimately. Yeah. As much of a circus as it, it became and as – I think the initial footage of the hit was in black and white. It was so long ago. Yeah. I mean, the first the first mission to the moon took, I think, eight days and three hours, and the arbitrator barely took a day less than that to yeah. render the decision. But yeah. after all that, at <clears> least <throat> at least uh, I think at least uh, reasonable people will say, okay, two games is okay. If that had been commuted to one, yeah. mm-hmm. that would have. 
Yeah. And then with him returning against Saskatchewan on August 1st, that could have been really messy. How good if him, but he still played. You mm-hmm. know, he still hasn't sat out any games for yeah. that. Like he's going to sit out too now. But yeah, that's still the part that bugs me, that he kept playing, contributing. Even that game, he had the pick. He had yep. a couple, a sack or two, I think one sack. He's, and Zach Claris is on the sideline and is still on the sideline. He, so he, That kid's a good player. Well, he is a we, good player. We had him on our necklace. Uh, I saw him at the... Uh, well, the University of Minnesota, and then he went, I saw the Philadelphia training camp, and I saw him and said, Brendan, this kid's good. Let's, so we put him on. Yep. But then he stuck around, and then he came off our English, so he could have been a writer. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't have as much discussion about him then. <laughs> <laughs> I just think, you know, Rob, I agree with you. They got it right eventually, and hopefully maybe this gives the opportunity for the CFL and the PA and maybe the league governors to take a look at this, this process that goes on here. I know the CBA just be said, I'm just bringing it up. We have to do it in a timely manner. This makes everybody look foolish. Not us, but it makes the league we look foolish. We can do that on our own. Though. It makes the league look foolish. It makes them look undecisive. It just doesn't leave me. It's not a good look for the league right now. And I think the league has another opportunity to step up and say, look, guys, we have to deal with this. Because another part that bugs me is there's no justice for, for Zach Kolaris. There's nothing to do with Zach Kolaris. He's on the sideline because of a guy targeting him, so-called friend, he said. So Zach Claris is still paying the price for this dirty, vicious hit, which I still think is one of the, the worst I've seen in football. So as much as we said about Zach Claris, Zach Claris is still a victim in this, and he still doesn't really have any justice because he's still out. So, I, But I don't know how you, you answer that question other than I can vent and rant about it. Well, all the talk up until the start of the season was Caleros. You know, how long is he going to last? Exactly. Five plays? Yeah, it's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, you thought, okay, at some point there's probably going to be something. I mean, he's dressed for... Well, prior to that game, he dressed for 16 regular season or playoff games with, or regular season or preseason games with the Riders, and he had to, he had to leave four of them after getting hit, mm-hmm. three with due to hits to the head. And, and but two of them were his fault. Once against Hamilton. I mean, once against uh, two Winnipeg. Two weren't his fault, though. Two of two pretty dirty hits. No, but the fact remains he's had to leave games with some frequency. Now it's 17 games that he's dressed for, and five of them he's had to leave. So it, the clock was ticking on Zach Calaros, but you never thought that on the first offensive series of the mm. season this would this would occur. And now, I mean, the, the Riders quarterbacking situation, I don't know if you refer to it as being in flux, but there's some uncertainty because what do you, as Brendan Tamman wrote about in his column in Tuesday's best-selling edition of the Leader Post, I think the elephant in the room is Zach Kalaros and what do the Rough Riders do with him? Do they activate him once he's off the six-game injured list? Do they activate him early? There's all sorts of, and what about, more importantly, what about Zach Kalaros' future as a, as a football player and uh What's his long-term health going to be? All because of one, one hit seconds before, seconds after the season began. If I'm a parent, or I'm telling him, take a long look, Zach. Take a long, long look at what's going to happen to yourself. We have, we have the proof what happens to guys with multiple concussions. It's mm-hmm. out there. But same token, he says, yeah, but I'm okay. I'm cleared to play. How do you stop him from playing if he's cleared to play? Because if he's medically mm-hmm. cleared to play... You can't. You can't stop. So then, med- then what do you do? You've yeah. had some experience in <laughs> CFL organizations. What kind of dilemma does this potentially create? I, I've never been at that level where I have to make those decisions. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if he wants to play, you know, what, how, how can you say you can't? You know, it's, it's tough. It's a tough situation. But uh, I think everybody and their dog is telling Zach, why don't you just pack it in? But you know those guys are so competitive. You know they want to they want to play. They're, that's what they do. And he was so successful. He almost he was one clip away from winning a Grey Cup as a quarterback. And you know he's uh, he's a pretty pretty good quarterback when he when he's on. But we've never really seen him on, have we? In the Saskatchewan world, other than that one game well, against Calgary. And, and in Montreal, he played well last yeah. year, and you know was serviceable. Mm-hmm. Um, he had ten and four. They had Rough Riders had a ten and four record in games that Zach Calaro started uh, last season. I think yeah. it's a bit of a it's a bit of a deceiving <laughs> stat because in those especially the Winnipeg game in the Winnipeg the game yeah. in Winnipeg, you know, there were two two pick <clears throat> sixes. Yeah. Um, the the opposition offense opposing offense scored more touchdowns in games quarterback by Zach Calaros than mm-hmm. the Rough Riders did. Uh, there were lots of field goals and lots of marches leading up to Brett Lowther field goals, and that you got to factor that in too because they move the ball reasonably well a lot of the time. But as far as getting touchdowns, as far as the overall performance of the offense, I think the best you can say about it in a lot of cases is that it was better than what they ended up getting in the West Division semifinal against against they Winnipeg. Had, they had an amazing defense last year, mm-hmm. which scored. I think I'm off top of my head, eleven touchdowns. Like that's 
pretty good production out of the defense. We haven't seen that this year out of the defense yet, other than against the lowly Argonauts. But maybe that's what something's got to happen. Maybe if the defense can stand up again and Zach comes back, maybe you can bail them out. But. Craig, what kind of an opportunity is this for the Riders and their defense this weekend? BC obviously is struggling to protect Mike Riley and uh, the Riders' defense has been up and down. They've put a lot of money into their into their defensive line and now they're playing a team with that's vulnerable on its offensive line. What kind of... Success starts with the line of scrimmage. Offensive line, defensive line. And you take a look at, at the difference with uh, the, 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 a couple of weeks ago with a quarterback play when he had protection and then when he was against. Calgary's defensive line and offensive line were just so good. And that was, that was the key. <clears throat> BC's the offensive line has not been very good, so it'll be very interesting to see how this defensive line, which you know was obviously bolstered uh, in, by free agency, how is it going to do against uh, that offensive line? And uh, boy, Riley's been taking it, and uh, they, they're like I said, success is the line of scrimmage. That offensive line has not been good enough to win games, so we'll see what happens this week. This so if you're, if you're the BC Lions right now, if you're Devon Claybrooks. What do you do to at least try to keep Mike Rowley upright? You do, you know, Luke Mullinder was talking about it on CKRM on, on Monday. Do you, do you go max protection? Do you do anything possible just to ensure that people can't get, get through? It depletes your arsenal of receivers, but it doesn't, doesn't do you. You could have Jerry Rice out there, but if you can't stand up in, in the pocket and make a throw, what are you going to do? Like, what do you do if you're the BC Lions now just to prevent this leakage up front? Well, it's a difficult thing because they went to training camp with the guys that they have, and it's not something that you can, hey, let's, there's an offensive lineman, let's, let's you know, bring him in. <clears throat> you know, max protect. I mean, that's obviously something that could happen. And, you know, so, okay, so you're going to go with four receivers out instead. No matter. <laughs> We've got to protect Mike Riley, the $700,000 quarterback. So it has to be done. He has to be protected. And they're not going to win unless they protect them. I think so. they tried max protection against the Eskimos and didn't do a whole lot of help either. Boy, right from the word go, they were after him. You know, and there's some big plays we've seen. One one sack stuff where he was, I can't remember who the player was. Beat the left tackle, beat a running back, and then. I tell and, you that that Edmonton team is a good team. You yeah. know, they went into Winnipeg, and it's tough to play in Winnipeg. You know, they they played them tough, and they've showed that this is a good team. And um, you know, it's it. The West is going to be interesting with the, those top three, Calgary, Winnipeg, and... and uh, Do you think it's a mistake Edmonton. to spend that much money on a quarterback? Because you, you really hurt... Like you're a personal guy, and you must be sitting there and talking... You know, when you talk... I know you don't make those, but yeah. you're talking about the top it, of the pyramid, yeah. and then this one, it's like this, <laughs> because it, there's not it, enough money. To, how do you spread the money around? Tell but, me, yeah, after Riley and Chung, they, they, it's almost a million dollars in yeah. two players, and Riley can't stay upright, and, and Chung's Chung one of the offensive linemen. Yeah. I think it's easy to say, you know... Why go after a quarterback and pay him seven hundred thousand? But when you think of it, you know, geez, they got Mike Riley. They got one of the better quarterbacks in the league. But now let's protect him. You know, so I, his receivers it, aren't helping him much out either. It, it's but. tough. It's tough to give a guy seven hundred thousand dollars in this day and age. Before it used to be no problem where you give a million yeah. to. A flutie or something like that but it's tough with the salary cap the way it is to give so much to one guy but then at the same token calgary gave 700 grand plus yep. to bo levi and look at calgary their their players are coming into filling them aren't big name guys they aren't big big contracts i think you'd probably say like kadreen carey probably not making no. more than 60 grand terry mm -hmm. williams is probably not making that but they, so they what they fill their holes mm -hmm. from interiorly and that's a sign of a good strong franchise i don't know if bc is a good strong franchise that can pluck from inside his roster to fill those holes with cheaper, more effective players. They, they spent some money on their defense, too, so mm -hmm. it's not all on Mike, like mm -hmm. Aaron Grimes and these guys, and they mm -hmm. haven't really stood up either. Like, mm -hmm. you watch BC, and that's a pretty bad football team. It's, they're not at the Argos level. That's a new standard being – is that a standard that can be set or a new low that can be – Well, they're, oh. they're close because they, they <laughs> lost by a point, so, I mean, it was a, it was a close game. They, so they could threaten the 03 tie cats that went one and 15. But what, we'll know that one no, and eight, one and 17. Pardon me. A lot of people have talked about the Rouge and how dumb it is, but the, how dumb is it? You have a league with two with diff, the end zones at 17 yards compared to what's supposed to be a 20. It's better yard. than Memphis. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's many of them. I know. Was that eight? 
Age? Something like that. Or even Commonwealth Stadium where they have it rounded yeah. off. Mm-hmm. So mean, the end zones, but I don't think Rainey would be able to do anything with his first step was back. Right? But three yards would have made a difference. He would have had a chance to run it out. He's mm-hmm. equally capable. So, you know, the Rouge happens. I know I'm going to – I love the Rouge. I think it's so Canadian that, you know, hey, right, you didn't do well enough, but we'll still give you a point. That's okay. Just relax. But when it wins a game, it gets a little sort of, yeah. you know, stomach wrenching. But it, it happened for the Rams in 2020, a uh, 2000. They went to Calgary, I, I believe, and they had to. Uh, it came down to the last play, and they had John Ryan punt the ball through the end zone for the game-winning rouge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my godson in grade nine at Luther punted for a game-winning rouge in the Regina mm-hmm. Intercollegiate Football League. So it's ha- it's a really cheesy way to end a game. I've always wondered. What would have happened if Dave Ridgway had gotten a single on the final kick of the 1989 Grey Cup? Would people call it the Rouge? Would people have been celebrating it's better the way kick. that game ended? If it was a 41-40 football game, yeah, it's funny. Mm-hmm. what would the, the, what would the legacy be the of, of winning a Grey Cup in that fashion? But mm-hmm. when you describe the 81 Grey Cup, Dave Cutler with a field goal yeah. right mm-hmm. at the end. What if that was a Rouge and Edmonton won 24-23? against Ottawa as yep. opposed to 26-23. Maybe it's yeah. easier to take if you think of the, the punting situation where it's like a 50-yard punt and they, it's the only option they have, and then it's a successful punt to get it out of the end zone. Maybe the fact that it was a missed field goal that gave up the Rouge makes it a little harder to take. I don't know, but I watched the end of that whole, watch that whole game to the last second. Mm-hmm. I hate the contention that a Rouge rewards favor, a re- 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 rewards failure. failure, because something had to happen to put the team – positively for to put a team in position for a rouge either they have to march the ball efficiently enough on offense to get the ball down there or the defense had to make a turnover or they had to get a big return they had to do something to put themselves in position for that what, what an point. optimist you are rob i, I bet like you, you could even come up with something good about the argos no yeah, the three receivers that they have. They do have great receivers. That, Bethel, Bethel <laughs> Thompson threw better than Mike Riley did when they played. Yeah. So there's some positives. Oh, good for you guys. That's awesome. <laughs> the special teams are pretty good, eh? But can they, can they go 0-18? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just... I, I think they can. I think they can, but it I, just doesn't happen. I hate happen. to say that. Sooner or later, I, they're going to play some team that doesn't play that well. I've got some way. friends on that, that staff, and, you know, it's, it's tough to see that. It really is. But And I'm surprised. I thought that, you know, with Corey going in there and... You figure that they would be a heck of a lot better than what they are, and they just, it's been, hasn't been, it hasn't looked good. How about speaking of looking good? How about Montreal? Yeah. Just when you think you can't wake up yeah. in the morning and see a weirder press release. Well, actually, I still think Frank Mike Sherman before training camp was pretty strange. And was. then you see they fart, they won two in the games, and Cavis Reed's gone. Boom. Yeah. That was just, what is yeah. this? Because the press releases come in French first, so you have to read them. Yeah. Skip down to get the. Well, I'm, I'm happy for Kahari because. He's one of the nicest guys in the yep. league, and you know he's obviously most outstanding player, and, and and he's coached. He put in his time, and now he's a head coach, and he's he's got two in a row, and they're they're looking not that bad, you know. And the thing is, is Vernon Adam, the yeah. quarterback, protection and quarterbacking. If you get that, you've got it shot. Uh, Vernon Adams has gone in there, and he's he's kind of playing the way he looked like he did in college. You know, when he was at Eastern and then he went to Oregon and, you know, you thought, hmm, this kid's pretty good. This, But he came up and he didn't, hasn't really looked all that great. But in the last few times, he's thrown the ball well. He's used his, his feet and uh, he's given them a chance. And, they, you know, they had some good signings in the offseason. And, um, you know, they're sure is going to be interesting to see now what's going to happen. Stand back is, is oh. just amazing. Well, he showed some signs last year. Yeah. You know, he, he was a good, solid running back that – you know, he, he doesn't go down on the first hit. He runs with some speed, runs with power, and, and, you know, he'll catch the ball out of the backfield. Oh, this, this typical CFL guy that you'd like to have. Yeah. He's done a good job. I'm still amazed that they still fired I, we We're hearing all sorts of rumors and stories now and speculation on things he was doing to manipulate the salary cap behind the scenes, some personal expenses, items yeah. on Twitter and social media. There's been no... Nothing has been proven. Nothing has been proven. I, I stress that. This is yep. just what we've been reading on social media, and unfortunately, social media... And if you can't rely on social media, oh, we exactly. can't rely... <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, they've, they've closed off part of the top stadium there, too, to try to make it look like it's fuller, mm-hmm. and I don't think it's really working that well. Mm-hmm. Not, they don't seem to be showing the stands a lot, but, boy, they need Montreal to come back. Sure they do. can't. They can't... You know, Toronto, you just write off Toronto and say, 
someday it'll come back, but Montreal's kind of a anchor. And if there's talk of this 10th franchise, I'm they get a 10th franchise and one of the, the original nine is gone and you're back to nine. What does the league do then? That's well, just... You know, well, you've been to Montreal and, and what a great place to go. Oh. It's a fantastic place to go. It's a it's a great stadium. It's tough to win. I remember we used to go in with the BC Lions. Uh, we, we, we drove down and scored a touchdown. And they drove down and Terry Baker kicked the field with a win. It, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good place. It's a lot of fun to be there. And, geez, it would be horrible to lose them. But I don't think it will happen. I think that these guys coming in, you know, they, they have some money. And it, 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 I think they'll, they'll stabilize things. It would just be nice to have get Toronto back. If you're a what? fan and you're putting together a bucket list, I know there's only nine teams. A bucket list is Montreal, a game in Montreal. Oh, absolutely. And stay at a downtown hotel. Walk Abs- all the way uphill yeah. Ooh, to yeah. the stadium uh, and I- sit in these great seats. And you can see old Montreal to here, new Montreal to there. you got the field. You're close right on top of the action. It's not only walking up the hill. You have to walk up a hill to get to the press box. Yeah, no, oh, no, my yeah, God. It's a good to, workout. To fetch a pail of water. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sorry. But I know that's not people... People who go there are always very excited and good food. Go Can't get your smoked meat, smoke then meat. go to the game. Go to the game, yeah. yeah. Dunn's, Schwartz. Dunn, Dunn, Schwartz. Yeah. I wonder, Rubens. I wonder if Biddle's Jazz and Ribs is still going. What a great jazz club, not far well, away from the stadium. Yeah, probably. Montreal's known for its festival, too. That was kind of too bad about the, one of the things about the Great Cup not going there, is they have a great festival atmosphere yeah. the, the, just for last, and that's just the one we know about. There's mm-hmm. a festival. So it's a, it's a place to go in the summer. It's got such a great vibe to walk around downtown Montreal and – Everyone, it's like in the Canadian city, but Montreal just is that. It's a little special stuff. Except they, they smoke too much. A little bit of smoking going on there. But, <laughs> and not cigarettes. Not that I haven't been there since pot's been legal. So what, what do you do about Toronto? Like, how do you, even if it's a good team, are people going to go? Like, I, I, I just, I don't know. Like, they've tried so many things for so many years. And even when they had Doug Flutie and they had Ricky Ray winning Grey Cups and they... You, they had pinball. They had John Candy. They had Gretzky. They've they've had everything, mm-hmm. uh, and you just can't build anything there. Is, is is do you just keep needing benevolent owners for that franchise to stay alive? I think it's a difficult thing. Even way back, I, I mentioned this before. We went to the Grey Cup in '89 and walking. We had our CFL stuff on, and people were heckling us. Ah, CFL sucks and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's a so-called big big league town and i don't know that the argos will ever you know get get into it but uh but i sure sure hope they would just rankles me when i hear that the raptors won one of the major championships no team from toronto has won a major championship mm-hmm. and i go well the argos just won one guys it's not as mm-hmm. if they've been forgotten but they are forgotten you yeah. go there i have relatives in toronto and they the last place they would go to is an argos game mm-hmm. and i say and i've said this before it is a game day product that's on par with anybody Mm-hmm. They do a great a great stadium to watch for game and great vibe even when there's nobody there, but no one wants to go. And I think you have to look at the economics a little bit. I think the Raptors sucked a lot of money out of that city and still are with jersey sales and hats and all those kind of things. And I think the Argos are just on the outside. So mm-hmm. I, I don't have a solution. Mm-hmm. I thought going to BMO Field was going to be the answer. Get them outdoors, get them I in. I think everybody thought that. And it's just turned out to be, well, they still fight with the soccer fans. Mm-hmm. Like, come on, get along, folks. It's just mm-hmm. it's two sports Teams that are the Toronto FC wasn't good for, was good for one year or two years I think. Man, I follow I don't follow MLS. Rob is a big fan of MLS. He loves the highlights. MLS is an <laughs> instant <laughs> reflex check for me. As soon as I'll, as soon as a sports cast goes to MLS highlights, how fast can I get to the remote control and just either off or change channels? And and how often is MLS up higher in a national sports cast than a CFL item? Yeah. It happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Drives me absolutely nuts. Yeah. And it's not all that great. Like, I like watching the Women's World Cup. That was fun. I like that kind of soccer. Yeah, but this, Major League Soccer. Does like, it ever end, Rob? Does it ever? It's is never, that a jazz song? Is it, it never, never end? Do you want to hear a jazz time? song? No, because I don't, like, I, I, jazz I don't have time. Craig likes listen. jazz. I like jazz. I can't listen to I don't have time. i got to get to the practice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. What, what was I, I was going to say something really impertinent. What was it? Um, oh, maybe. Uh, Stop the Argos. About the Argos. Oh, yeah. In 89, I went to the Great Cup just to watch and um, got in a cab. Patrick Davitt and I got in a cab. And the cab driver asked us what we were in town for. And we said, Great Cup. And he had the cab driver had no idea that it was on. Yep. But in the course of the cab ride, we started talking about the fact that the Buffalo Bills were playing host to the Cincinnati Bengals that weekend. So there was a buzz, a football buzz, at least in, in that cab. 
about an NFL game being played in Buffalo, but the cab driver didn't even know the Grey Cup was on that week. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was 30 years ago, but mm-hmm. that that's the mentality that I don't think has has changed. Sad no. is it hasn't changed. Nope, it, hasn't it hasn't changed. No, like I can, you know, I've gotten some cabs, BMO Field, and I'm telling the guy how to get there. Hmm. Which is and which is why I've kind of gone to Uber in Toronto because the cab drivers are, mm-hmm. they don't use their GPSs, which is a whole other side story. But yeah, mm-hmm. they don't know what BMO Field is, so I have to tell them how to. But I'm just a prairie guy. I just say keep going that way. Mm-hmm. We'll be there in a moment, mm-hmm. man. But do you want to talk riders? Yeah, let's talk riders. Like so, they got BC. That's why we're we, here. we talked BC to death, but I think we we talked about Zach. We've talked about uh, what I don't know. We talked about what Cody's got to do. Assuming Cody is a guy again, I'm. There's no reason to think he's got to, he's got to play better than he did against the uh, – geez, I can't even remember who they played last. Calgary, 37-10, <laughs> July 6th. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's been a good bye week. First time I shaved since then. So been nice. <laughs> yeah, you did a really nice job. Of I it. know. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, Cody has to play better defensively. There's some there's some issues. I really think there are some defensive issues. And as we've, we've, we wrote about earlier this year, it's not Chris Jones' defense. This isn't that imaginative blitzing – coming at you from all different angles with everything oh. taking advantage of different body types. It's more vanilla, would that be face to say, so fair, to, so to say, other than Derek Moncrief, who's playing at a level of any linebacker in the league as good as any. Charleston Hughes has five sacks. Yep, Charleston Hughes. In his last three games, too. Yeah. I mean, when you look at this defense, Craig, like what do you make of it? It's It certainly doesn't have the dynamism or effectiveness of the Chris Jones defense, but it's oh. also early. Very early. And I think that the defense is going to be okay. If you take a look at all of the, the three different areas of it, the, the defensive line, I think that's a solid defensive line. They've got a couple of good defensive ends, you know, with uh, with a kid from Calgary that they signed. I can't remember the name. Well, my, uh, Micah, uh, Micah, Micah Johnson. Micah Johnson's a tackle. Yep, tackle. But the, the plus the end, end guys, I mean, I think that's a solid defensive line. Those linebackers, Alamemian was he wasn't around. He got engulfed. He uh, maybe the the rust, not you know, like somebody had mentioned that it's almost like a training camp, uh, you know, preseason game for yeah. him. I know he only played four games last year, so yeah. it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. So, um, but those linebackers, I like those linebackers. I like the Davis kid, um, yeah. the Judge. I thought he did a heck of a job in the middle, and and Moncrief is boy, he's he's a heck of a Sam linebacker. Yeah. And then the defensive backfield, that you know, they're pretty solid now. They didn't have Marshall last game, and I think that that's a, that's a big loss when you lose one of your corners, cover corners. Uh, I think all in all, you know, they've got some pretty good talent. Chris Jones is, I mean, some of the stuff you'd see, you know, he'd rush to, you know, I mean, it was just a just a, such a different different type of a defense and. We haven't seen the craziness, you know, yet from Jason, but uh, we'll see what happens. But I think personnel-wise, I think they've got some good kids. So if the personnel is there, why isn't the re- aren't the results there? Well, I think that they didn't get the offensive line of Calgary did a good job yeah. of what they saw, and uh, Arbuckle had the opportunity to keep his feet and throw where uh, Fajardo didn't have that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that's a big thing. You know, you have to – Anthony Calvillo wasn't a good quarterback when he was getting rushed, but if he had time, poof. Yeah. You know, so it, I, I think that I think that pressure is key. And, and it's, it's, it's imperative that, you know, they'll get after Riley, and hopefully they can do that. But the last time, it was one at the line of scrimmage. You know, the Calgary's offensive line was solid. Calgary's uh, defensive line was, was solid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the offensive line with the Riders, which is, I don't think that they... Cody didn't wasn't comfortable, and I think that was, was never, a big... He happened. was running when he didn't have to run yeah. in yeah. a lot of cases. The, yeah. There were times when the when the protection broke down, but I don't think the frequency with which he was sacked is necessarily something that should the offensive lineman should completely wear. There were times when it looked like, okay, stand in there, but... Mm-hmm. I think it's different, different when you're down there, though. Different I mean, when you're down there, because yeah. you're, you're, you know, some guys breathing down your neck, so you feel like you got to get out. And uh, you know, I, I think it, it's key that they they protect him and give him an opportunity. Now, the last, don't matter if it was against Tron or whoever, the kid made some really good throws. He really looked like a solid quarterback, and as that, he did against Ottawa. That's in him, and he didn't look like one against. No. Nope. So, what do you do if you're Cody Fajardo, if you're Stephen McAdoo, and? BC's obvious foot, football's a copycat league and our game and the Lions are going to look at what Calgary did effectively mm-hmm. against the Rough Riders and perhaps try to mimic that. So 
if they face that zone again and they're basically daring you to go over the top, and that's certainly something that Zach, pardon me, Cody Fajardo has shown not only that he likes to do, but that he can do. But if they're going to play that zone, what do you do to liberate the passing attack? Does that mean yet the running game has to be effective so that the 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 uh, they have, that has to be honored by the defense? Does that then create the one-on-one matchups? Because against Calgary, on first down plays, William Powell averaged three point six yards per well, carry. Cal- so they were in a pickle on second down a lot of the time, and then the zone can take effect. And they, it was like they were just daring him to go over the top. Calgary did a heck of a job against the run, and that's that's a big part of this. They got one of the best running backs in the league. And, and they held him. They did a hell of a job against the run, and that's critical. Um, I don't know that BC's going to be able to do that. I don't know that they're going to be able to stop the run like Calgary did. But Devon's a defensive coach. He's coming from a, de- a solid defensive background. Shouldn't he be able to figure out how to stop William Powell and put Cody Fajaro in that I, kind of position? Again, I think, yeah, they can figure it out. But now it's a matter of getting out there and executing. You know, Because yeah. you know, he, he, was, he was questioning the execution of his players. Yeah. <clears throat> it sounded like he's in favor of it to steal a little... John McKay, John McKay is like his line, but I've never... We weren't blocking, but we made up for it by not tackling. Yeah. John McKay was yeah. great. Yeah. That was like still one of the all-time best in the NFL. So what, if, so what do you... What if the Riders can get William Powell going and... That's, and that, that's huge. Then what does that liberate? What does that create if the if the BC Lions have to pay attention to the, the Rough Riders running game in, in, in an effective form? Well, they're not, they're not, you know, going after the quarterback with 100%. They've, they've got to play. got to make sure that, that there's no run. They've got to play the run and, uh, and then, you know, take it from there. So, it, you know, it's, it's a matter of if they can get that run game going, that's going to help um, uh, Cody. Fajardo, uh, you know, with regards to just like he did against Ottawa, just like he did against uh, um, the Toronto. You know, he, he's got to do, you know, because a kid can make plays. A kid can make the passes. Now, get that run game going, and then other stuff will follow. Play action. <laughs> you know, that's a huge thing. And that's huge. what Craig, Craig Dickinson was saying right from the outset. They want to be able to base a lot on the play action, but if the run game isn't established, you mm-hmm. can't use play action, nope. and then you run into the predicaments that they kept running into against Calgary. Yep. And I think the next time Riders will play Calgary, it'll be a little different. I think that they went in, and you know, they were two games that they you know played pretty damn good, and then all of a sudden they're going, oh, wait a minute. Just like Craig said after the game, well, I don't think we're as good as we thought we were. Well, now it's back, you know, back to the drawing board, and uh, let's get going. There, it, I, to me, it's not a bad team. I think there's, there's something... Special teams, um, you know, I mean, it's a work in progress. There's no doubt about it, but I, I don't think it's a bad team. Are we in a, are the Riders in a must-win situation? Are these two, I, if they are going to become with a split, is it got to win too? Just to sort of stop all the naysayers, put themselves in a better position to be fourth? Well, this team never had great starts under Chris Jones and made the no. playoffs each no. of the last two years. Yeah. It was, I remember but always it, panicking. It's a, but it's such a front-loaded schedule with home games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's where it really becomes crucial when you've got so many home games early mm-hmm. and you've got the concentration of road games later in the year. You've you've got to make a bit of hay, especially if they don't beat BC at home, what promise is there that they're going to go to Vancouver and win? That's and then it's tough. a very ugly week with one and four hanging mm-hmm. over this team. Yeah, absolutely. And then and you get to face a tough Hamilton team that's already beaten you. Like it could spin out of control pretty quickly. Then they go to quickly. Montreal and then, then they get about another bye week. So Ugh. Then Winnipeg twice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not, e- it's not easy. It's, a, it's tough to win in this league. You know, it, it, <laughs> Toronto is a little different, but I mean, take a look at every, every other team. I mean, you go in, it's, it's not easy to win. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is in this league. I mean, Hamilton... You would think they'd be five and zero, considering who they who they've beaten. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> you look at who they lost to, mm-hmm. and that was kind of the, the wake up game for Absolutely. for Montreal. Yeah. So you just you just don't know, no. and uh, which makes it a bit of a scary proposition for the Riders going into this weekend because you would think that the Lions are in a situation where they might be easy prey because of the problems they've had protecting uh, protecting Mike Riley and the other issues that they've faced, but. It seemed like the Riders had a good situation going into Calgary with Bolivar going against Calgary with the with Bo Levi Mitchell sidelined mm-hmm. and Nick Arbuckle comes in mm-hmm. and does what uh, what he does and Kadeem Davis does what he mm-hmm. does and, or did what he did and mm-hmm. and suddenly it's okay you can't really you can't presume a lot when you're one and three Mm-mm. can can you not at all 
That's why I found Craig's it's, statement. They're not as good as they thought they were. Well, we were kind of thinking they're not as good as they thought they were either. Other than we kept riding on the Toronto because we spent all year writing how good these guys are supposed to be. We finally saw some flashes against Toronto. And mm-hmm. then reality, as your lead said, reality 37, Saskatchewan 10, which was really what it was. It was a big reality gut check reminder of everybody that the Calgary Stampeders are still the defending Grey Cap champs. And it's still a team, a yeah. franchise loaded with talent and guys yeah. you've never heard of. And you got to admire it. I know people were supposed to hate this. Some riders were supposed to hate Cowie, but I think every rider fan looks over there and say, yeah, but I'd sure love to have a franchise like that playing in Mosaic Stadium and not an old decrepit McMahon Stadium. be kind of fun. Offnagel was incredible. Just does his, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they do such a good job over there. But at the same token, you know, I mean, Jeremy, Jeremy's going to, it's going to be good. You just wait. Jeremy's going to put it together. Craig Dickinson, I love that guy. He's a, he's an excellent excellent football man he's a good good coach and uh communicates well um, you know i'm ex- I, I keep on saying i'm excited for this team and you know it, it's almost like growing pains for this year uh, i don't know how many people would say yeah they're going to the gray cup this year but you know if they can come out and they can play some pretty good football and you know um, it, it's 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 a building process and, and you know it's it's not one of those things that's going to happen overnight it's just going to be one of those things that's okay there's a there's a building block there's another one you know uh, getting getting Cody some some real good playing time and solidifying that offensive line so that they can get protection so that uh, Cody can do what he did in the other two games are they caught between two, two cultures I I just wonder if this year is just not meant to be from the standpoint that Chris Jones leaves when he does. Um, you've got Craig Dickinson as the head coach. You've got Jeremy O'Day as, as the general manager. They both came in oh. late in the game. But it's still Chris Jones' coaching staff. Yep. It's still Chris Jones' influence. It, you're trying to transition from a Chris Jones team, but there's still evidence of that regime. Are, are they just? Do they need a, a year just to put their own stamp on it? Is this just a... Well, most times when a general manager in comes in year? And, and, and hires a head coach, that head coach brings his own people yeah. up. He, he, uh, Craig didn't get that opportunity because all those guys were signed. Not that those guys, he wouldn't have. I don't know. I have no idea what he would have done with the coaching staff, but uh, you have that opportunity to bring, put your stamp on. And, and Craig, Craig Dickinson didn't get an opportunity to do that. It, it's a tough situation for both O'Day and Dickinson to go into. And, uh, you know, it's they're dealt with the cards and, you know, they're playing with the cards and, you know, they've they've had some good signings. I can hardly wait to see McRoberts. I can hardly wait to see what he does when he gets, yeah. if he gets an opportunity but you know it's 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 not an easy situation for those guys and just like you said it's probably going to be one of those years where you go well you know uh, you know it's 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 not like it would be if it was in a different situation so I don't think Jeremy O'Day and Craig Dickinson would agree with that very much though because it's this is there's no building for next year it's about winning a great cup this year there's building oh oh, no doubt no doubt but their whole goal is to get to the Great Cup this year, and I, I understand what you're trying to but, say. But it is it is a process. It's oh, yeah. building because all of a sudden, you know, your Chris Jones was had ran everything he did. You name it, he did it. Yeah. Now he's gone, and he's gone in January. Yeah. Where generally speaking, what you're doing is you're putting a playbook together. You, you know, you've everything's, you know, and, and all, now okay, <laughs> we need a new head coach now. You know, so, yeah. I, I, but. It, when I say that, it's always a building process, and especially at this time when they go in so late, and mm-hmm. you know all all the different things with the, with the quarterback situation, and now it, it's you know you know that's what I mean. You yeah. know, it's a, it's a building type. And thing. I like how Craig has dealt with it as a rookie head coach. You know, well, he doesn't have any choice, but we move on. You know, and it's, they no one said next man up yet, which is always key. and nobody has said we got to go one and zero this week. No, mm-hmm. that's so, all I miss. You have haven't you written that yet? No. No, 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 no. I thought you had. Murray, I should let you, we should let you get to, get to practice. I, I will be joining you later. Any final thoughts before you speed over to uh, well, Mosaic I, Stadium and get I see pulled over? I see these next three games as must wins. I really think and mm-hmm. I'm going to throw the pressure on them. This is whoever Cody's got to step up as a quarterback. He's got to play better. He's got to have less happy feet. He's got to commit. Defense has got to be that defensive line's got to get after Riley. Because there's a little bit of... I think there's a little bit of a rivalry and, or a push to see what the Eskimos did. This line they spent a lot of money on. Let's see what they can do. Mm-hmm. And if they don't win these three, and I know we had in August, again, scratching our heads, wondering what's going on with this team, and then they bounce back in September. So, But it's, uh, it gets really tough Yeah, once you get past these BC games too. Mm-hmm. So, 
Craig, any final <coughs> thoughts? Uh, do you have your 2013 Grey Cup ring on you that I, you can flash I, for us? I don't. No, <laughs> no, no. I don't, but I should have I brought it. But yeah, yeah we, have, we always encourage our guests to bring their Grey Cup rings. Thanks yeah. for wearing the Tennessee hat for yeah. uh, Peyton Manning. <coughs> for Peyton Manning, yeah, absolutely. I know. Or is it maybe in Chris Stapleton, Tennessee whiskey? Because he did on, I heard he knocked Craven's roof off. I bet. The roof off of Craven. I Peyton bet. Manning. Peyton Manning, well, holy cow. Yeah, you know, looking forward to this back-to-back. It should be very interesting. You know, BC Lions, Saskatchewan, it's, uh, boy, we've we've had some pretty good games. We, uh, the Riders have had some pretty good (laughs) games with them uh, in the past, and it's going to be a a pretty cool situation. I, I I don't think it's the end of the world if they split, but uh, it would be nice for the Riders to get too. BC is a tough place to win, though, and even though, and especially, especially for BC, <laughs> and, they, and they open the roof, one of the smallest Sorry. roofs. I go, yeah. I keep going. What's the big deal about this little roof? Opening? Yeah, no kidding. It's kind of funny. It is. It's funny. Where do you Bro- want to read that? Because I stumble over it every week. Sure. If you enjoy the podcast, and why yeah. wouldn't you? Please leave a review <laughs> and a five star rating. It helps us grow the podcast. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Are there other places? Sorry. I didn't. I haven't heard, even heard of. If you'd like to send us a question, you can email Rob at Rob Vanstone at Post. No, sorry, R Ooh. Vanstone, R Vanstone at postmedia.com, and we'll read it on the show. Once again, clear slate, clear plate. No, no questions. Clear sheet for questions. You can follow Rob on Twitter at Rob Vanstone, and me at Murray LP. Sir, Craig. Thanks again, Craig, Craig Smith. We thanks. can't thank you no. enough. Uh, you and your uh, wonderful wife, Kathy, are two of the finest people we'll ever have the honor of meeting. And well, we're really glad it. you spent some time with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yep. Uh, we'll do this next week with number 60. Uh, I don't think I really have to <laughs> uh, uh, specify who number 60 <laughs> is. I think most people know that. But uh, Don, Don Banuk. Don Banuk. <laughs> a fine, fine human being. Um, he was actually a... He, was, he played for the 66 Riders, sort of. He practiced with them, uh-huh. but never really got an opportunity. He just kind of practiced with them all year. Wow. And then after that, became mm-hmm. a, a, a stalwart defensive lineman mm-hmm. for the team. But he got that, that first taste with the 1966 Rough Riders. So. Who's the other guy? Uh, Gene. Gene. The number 60. Oh yeah, Gene. Uh, yeah. What was his name again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll have the we'll we're 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 into this whole run of offensive linemen as we go yeah. through the fifties and sixties. Yeah. So, uh, number sixty, Gene Mikowski, will be discussed. At, we should get him like, as a guest someday. But yeah, well, it's, uh, not around the time of the election, though. I think we might get in trouble with the box. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, for Murray, for Craig, I'm Rob. We'll do this again next week with number sixty. Take care. <laughs>